Welcome back to the Cheap Life Podcast and welcome returning guest, Andy Mann. Hey, Matty, how you doing, man? Very good. It's so cool to have you back. It's actually um, just over 100 episodes ago that we had you in. Um, wow. I know, right? And you, you've been a very big influence on both Stacey and I, but also on our community with helping to improve their sleep. So, I mean, everything from the blue blocking glasses that we wear, which is Blue Box, which is what you, you the company that you run, but also the sleep mask that we use, which is the Remedy Sleep Mask. Um, and what we actually did as a company decided to buy a heap of Blue Box off of you so we could utilize them in our retreats. Um, because it's like, how, how do you get people to understand this is a really good product and that it works really well without them ever having tested it? So as a company, we're like, this is a really good investment for us to have to be able to say, hey, on retreats, let's put them on, see how you guys actually function. And we've found like an, pretty much 80% of the people who come on retreat will buy the glasses after, after using them, um, which is obviously that speaks in volumes by itself. But it's pretty cool just to kind of see um, how good a night's sleep you can have from one night of wearing these things, which is just absolutely insane, really. But it, it's cool and it speaks volumes for, for the product itself. Thanks, man. No, that's epic. And um, yeah, you're right. It's, it's one of those things, isn't it, Blue Light, that until you actually try a, a real high-end product like, like the Blue Blocks glasses, you, you don't know. You know, you don't know how sick you were or, or you know, how bad your sleep was or your energy levels were it's it's, it's much like diet really you know mm-hmm. people you know might be in shape they might be in a crappy diet but um you know they might feel okay doing it but you know until they actually go clean up their diet you know maybe exercise more that they realize wow I, I really didn't feel and um feel optimal or, or feel like i'm functioning um to to how um to, to the levels i guess that that, that um you know they're capable of doing so yeah the, the lights are the same thing you know it's it's very much um you know until people actually start managing it and, and taking it seriously um that they start to notice how um how much better they can feel yeah it's discovering that new normal and that's something we find a lot with with the nutrition we do with people is within six weeks four weeks even a couple of weeks people are like mm. oh my god i just feel so much better like I just feel clean, which is kind of a crazy thing to, to, for people to say. <laughs> but yeah. like, it's literally that feeling of, oh, I'm sleeping well, I'm now refreshed, I'm, I'm training well or I'm moving well or I just don't feel gluggish. I've got, I've got clarity in my mind and it, I think it's, it's a contribution of everything in the lifestyle. It's not just one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. And, and we've seen um, a real sort of uptake um, since we last spoke in, in that bodybuilding um, mm-hmm. community as well. So people like Chris Geffen, Roger Snipes and um, Ben Pakolsky are all sort of utilizing blue blocks and, and they're just saying like they're lifting more weight than they've ever been able to lift. They're going for longer. They're getting more stamina um, just by managing their sleep. So it's it's great to be able to influence those people as well that have historically been in that sort of, you know, fitness and nutrition space and, and really not really paid any attention to light or EMFs, um, temperature and, and mindfulness. And when they're adding those to their um you know, to their arsenal of, um, you know, lifestyle hacks, they're, they're leveling up when they thought, you know, they couldn't and they've been plateaued for so long. So, yeah, it's really, um, it's really exciting times. And it, it's great to see people, you know, more and more people adopt light. And you can see it with the growth mm-hmm. of, of our company, you know, like so many more people now are um, utilizing our products and using our blogs as a free resource to try and hack their light environments and, and, you know, live their most optimal, um, optimal life. So, um yeah it's it's pretty cool man it's cool yeah, to see that's, that's super cool i mean just just hearing that like of bodybuilders or powerlifters or anything who have plateaued and then all of a sudden been able to increase because of that one shift like they're people who are very structured in their routines and really know what's going on um and so they'd be the people that would notice definitely one of those things the most when they when they change one yeah. little thing it can make such a big difference so that's yeah. really cool. Um, one thing I did want to dive into is how do you test it? Like, say, for instance, and this is something that we had before we bought Blue Blocks. We had Blue Blocking glasses, um, but we it wasn't until we wore the Blue Blocks that we actually saw a really massive difference. Like, I saw an improvement from wearing that other brand um, glasses. And I think they were just like an Amazon GP. I can't quite mm-hmm. remember. But when we tried the Blue Blocks, we saw a massive increase. And so one thing I wanted to dive into first, I think, before we dive into pretty much the studies around Blue blo- uh, around blue Light, which is what today's podcast is really going to cover, but was actually how do you test if you've got a set of glasses to see if, they're, if they are actually doing the things they say they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good question because not all Blue Light glasses are created 
equal. Um, and what you find is, and, and you've been on this journey and I've been on this journey, we all start out buying the cheapies off Amazon and, you know, they're, they're not really doing much, you know, they're, they're a little bit of an improvement as, as I saw and you saw. But, you know, when you actually experience the real deal, it's like, wow, this is this is it. And the same is true of supplements, you know, you can buy crappy supplements with fillers and think you might get a bit of a, you know, a, a kick, but then you buy a proper, you know, lab grade evidence based one and you're, you know, you're flying. Yeah. Same is true for blue light glass. So the first test is um, a really simple one. OK, so you need a red or deep orange lens for after sunset. If it's not that color, you are not wearing a pair of blue blockers. OK, so if it's yellow or it's clear, you are not wearing blue blockers. They are blue light filtering glasses. Fantastic for the day. Um, but we can obviously come on to the, the pros and cons of, of other sort of brands that are out there um, as well to give yeah. people, a, you know, the power to choose the correct ones. But if initially, if it's not amber, if it's not red, if it's not that deep sort of orangey red color, you haven't got blue blockers. So mm -hmm. that's your first step. OK, so if you haven't got those then you need to go and research and, and get some of those. Now, it's very, very clear in the academic literature that there's a specific zone of light that you need to block 100 percent of in order to fully optimize melatonin production, which is your sleep hormone. OK, mm -hmm. and that falls between 400 nanometers to 550 nanometers okay yeah. so what that means in layman's terms is it's a hundred percent of blue light because blue light runs from 400 to 495 nanometers and it's almost all of the green spectrum green runs from 495 to 570 mm -hmm. but we only need to block 100 percent between 495 to 550 mm -hmm. so that is your literally gold standard of of testing your glasses now you can't no one can rush out and spend 10 grand on a lab grade spectrometer it's just it's <laughs> pointless because then you you know your 150 dollar pair of glasses is a little bit a uh, little bit expensive so um what you what you need to do is first of all you need to reach out to the company you're looking to buy from so whether that be blue blocks or another brand totally fine it's up to people what they where they want to buy from um drop them an email and say right i've seen your sleeping glasses or your amber lens glasses or whatever it may be can you tell me the percentage of light that is blocked between 400 and 550 nanometers? If it's any less than 100%, that's when you walk away. Mm -hmm. If they say it's 100%, then you need to ask one further question, and that's can you send us your lab spectral analysis report? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that report is a graph. So it's a nice, pretty graph. You can see them on our websites so if you click into any individual product. And it just it has all the colors of light and it shows you um, what percentage of light is blocked or what is being let through. And you'll see from our lab spectrometer test that 100 percent is blocked in, in this correct range, 400 to 550. And then light starts creeping in after that, which is fine because it doesn't affect melatonin. Hmm. If the company can't produce either of those two items. So the first one, a reply saying how much light's blocked and to the, the spectral analysis report, that's when you need to run for the hills because all they're doing is grabbing a load of cheap glasses from China, passing them off as blue blockers. They have no idea about what how light impacts is the impacts the biological system mm -hmm. um and, and you might as well save your money because they'll probably get them from china for about five bucks a, a pair of glasses sell them to you for 50 60 dollars um and you'll be wasting your money. You, know, you, you buy cheap um you, you end up buying twice um so you're better off going for the gold standards and yeah you know there's there's a couple of companies out there as well and i won't obviously mention names but there was a really interesting post from um, our friend, Dr. Jack Cruz, the mm -hmm. other uh, week, and he basically called out a pair of, um, he called out a company that were blocking blue, um, blue and green light, but all the way up to like 580 nanometers. Um, and he wrote, basically wrote in there that, you know, more's not always better. Some green light post sunset, post 550 nanometers is actually beneficial for mm -hmm. ABC. And he listed off a load of sort of mitochondrial um, science Benefits. that this normally does. Yeah. So you've got to remember more is not always better. Um, you know, you've got to remember that our ancestors didn't sit in complete darkness. You know, they had, um, you know, campfires. They had a lot of red, orange and yellow light, but they also still had, you know, little bits of green light as well, which would have been coming from um, very ambient sources like stars and, and the moon. Mm -hmm. So you just got to bear in mind that, you know, completely causing blackout um, in the evenings or, you know, blocking too much can actually still be, um, as detrimental as letting in some blue light. So you're better off finding a company that educates first. And this is kind of where we've 
try to lead the way. We want to provide the education. Yes, we have the products that back up all this, you know, with all the literature and science. Um, but, you know, if, if people want to go out and explore and, and try and find a cheaper pair, which I, I, spoiler alert, you can't um, <laughs> but actually do what um, do what they say, then, um, you know, be, be my guest and take this information and, and, you know, empower yourself to be able to go and, you know, speak to companies and not just buy because someone is saying, yeah, these are blue blockers. You're going to sleep better because chances mm. are they're, they're probably not going to help you. Yeah, definitely. And that the whole uh, more isn't always best is, is so true. Like there's so many studies that come out saying like a, a classic is red wine is healthy or that dark chocolate's healthy or that coffee's really good for your liver. And then people go and over, overindulge on these things and then they, they get, um, yeah, they just don't function that well. And they wonder why because it's, yeah, it's, it's meant to be good for them. And people, people need to do that in, in every aspect of life. You've hit the nail on the head and coffee's a big one for me. I can't drink caffeinated coffee because it causes me to have anxiety yeah um whereas there's huge benefits in drinking coffee because of the antioxidants and polyphenols mm -hmm. but what you've got to realize is when you start looking at um looking at how the body works melatonin is is referred to as the sleep hormone yeah. okay which is which is 50 percent correct but melatonin is the most powerful antioxidant um that, that the body can produce mm. so if you're exposing yourself to artificial light after dark you're not going to be producing um, optimal levels of melatonin, yeah. Yeah. And you know, melatonin is is an is an excellent um, free radical scavenger, and it's also um, a neutralizer of um, reactive oxygen species within the within the body. Now, there was a really interesting study that came out that that you guys probably would have seen me post, which was about how melatonin actually works as a um, antioxidant. Yeah. And typically, when so an, an antioxidant is in in the body. We we create um, byproducts. Okay, so we have chemical reactions that happen um, that produce leftover oxygen um, atoms. And then what um, an antioxidant will do is, as it says, antioxy. It will come and bond with it and neutralize it, and all's good. Yeah. Now, when you utilize things like polyphenols, um, other antioxidants that you can get from nature, they neutralize that that um, free oxygen um, inflammatory marker. But what they do is as a result of that chemical reaction, they actually then release a smaller amount of, of that um, inflammatory marker back into the system. So you might clear, say, 60% of it, but 40% of the inflammation will still re remain in it's the body. Not, yeah. Yeah. So what happens with melatonin is it's the only known antioxidant that when it reacts with um, free radicals and, and um, rogue oxygen atoms, the half life of, of that and, the, and the, basically the, um, uh, the, the byproduct that is formed from that melatonin and the byproduct that then reacts and then forms further byproducts doesn't actually produce any um, any further inflammation or any mm. other additional oxygen species. So it's the cleanest reaction that you can have in your body in terms of neutralizing those those um, oxygen atoms. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. I actually, I never go around to reading that article. And there mm. you go, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, really interesting one because people just think, oh, it's another antioxidant. If I pop a few blueberries, it's the same as, you know, getting some good um, melatonin secretion. But actually, when you look at it from a deeper level, um, the way that melatonin actually reacts is, is so clean and doesn't produce any other um, negative byproducts. Whereas, you know, these other things that we get from diet actually still produce negative byproducts, even though the, the net benefit outweighs the, the net negative. Mm. Um, if you utilize um, the body's natural system in the pineal gland, which is the, the excretion of um, melatonin, um, you, you're going to get like, you know, rather than 70% of, of, of something from diet, you're going to get 100% because melatonin yeah. is so powerful. That is, that's incredible. That's so cool. Um, and I mean, that's another reason why we got you back on to talk about these blue light studies because there's so much coming out about blue light now that um, it is really quite, it's not scary, I guess, but it's just we need to be aware of it. We need to understand what's going on. And we've made all of these, like we've manufactured so much in the world right now that we need to mm -hmm. see what's good and what's bad. And there's things that get thrown around about the, the 5G cell towers they're putting up everywhere. There's stuff that gets put on about lights. Um, there's things that get talked about food and I guess for for some people it's hard trying to decide what is right and what is wrong and I think when we can always relate it back to studies then it, it gives you a fair sign to say hey this is actually true like where we're starting to see it come out the, the proof of it is in the pudding based on the science yeah which is great so um before diving, oh, actually, let's talk about blue light making you sick. So the, there was an article that you guys posted, pretty much around 
if you're always using your phones in bed, things like that, you've always got that blue light right in your face. Um, how it does create, or it, it stops the melatonin production, which we know, and then from there, because you're awake, you start to create extra cortisol levels, um, mm-hmm. which essentially is just extra stress in the body for long amounts of time. We know that long, not a high amounts of stress is not going to be great for, for anything within the body. It's pretty much causing larger amounts of inflammation. So what else, what else is going on there apart from the higher, higher amounts of cortisol? Yeah, cortisol is a really interesting one um, in terms of how it how it reacts to blue light because cortisol during the day is is really beneficial. Like mm. it's it's almost the key in the ignition um, of getting us started for the day. We get um, you know cortisol awakening response in the morning, which jump starts us out of bed and gets us you know going and active during the day. So cortisol should never be demonized. It's it's an essential hormone. Um, it just needs to be managed correctly, but it's very very sensitive to light. Now. The studies that are out there um, are quite few and far between in how blue light would elevate cortisol consistently. Mm -hmm. Okay, Um, and I always used to be a firm believer from listening to a lot of people in this area that, you know, blue light jacks your cortisol levels up and keeps it high constantly. It's actually not the case. When you um, when I did a little bit more research on this, there's a phenomenon um, that actually happens when you expose yourself to cortisol after dark, and that is it reverses your cortisol cycle. So what Mm -hmm. um, what happens is your cortisol levels get high in the evening when they should be low and that impacts the production of melatonin yeah when that um production of melatonin decreases we don't get into deep restorative sleep as well we don't get the the growth and repair and then we wake up in the morning with low cortisol levels which makes us really sluggish and fatigued and people can't get out of bed i used to be one of them i used to lay in bed till like 11 a.m and then over time this you, you, you almost develop a bit like insulin resistance. You mm-hmm. develop this resistance to cortisol where your body then just decides what the F is going on here. It just pumps cortisol out all the time. And then it just over time will just slowly increase to um, to levels where it's just chronically high. You get chronic stress, anxiety, depression in the worst cases. Mm. Um, so we've got to be careful of, of that. And I did. I released a video on YouTube actually yesterday. Um, it go out to the mailing list on Monday where you can actually turn your smartphone um, red now. And I can't red, remember yeah. If the, like, yeah, we actually talked about it in the last one. So yeah, so like get it nice and that. red. Yeah. So that's a, a key thing to do. But what people have got to remember is, and we get it so often, everyone's on different stages in their light journey, and I get this, um, but it still frustrates me, mm. is that people go, oh, I've got night shift mode on, it's cool, I'm, I'm protected against blue light. And it's like, you know, my response is, is yeah, number one, it doesn't work. But two, you know, can you tell me what app your fridge light has or your TV or your house lights? Like, I just, I'd, I'd be keen to know, like, you know, because that still gives out blue light the same. Right? So, yeah. Um, you know, sort of tongue in cheek there. But, um, you know, people have just got to realize that blue light isn't this phenomenon that sits in your smartphone. You know, it's, it's everywhere. It's any mm-hmm. kind of white light. You know, white light looks white because of the, the, the magnesium and phosphorus in the um uh, phosphorus, sorry, in, in the light bulb, in the filaments. Um, but it's it's just vast amounts of blue that are being given out. And, mm. you know, it's it's not just messing around with the cortisol cycles and it's not just messing around with your melatonin cycles. It's damaging other hormones as, as well. And um, insulin's one of them. There's a really interesting study that shows that insulin levels um, can rise in the, in the presence of blue light um, mm. and in a complete um, disconnect from food. So it doesn't matter what diet you're having. And wow. you know, I was on a, a, a real cool podcast a few weeks back um, and we were talking, it was like a ketogenic one. Yeah. And we were talking about weight loss stools and, and how light can sort of impact those. And, you know, cortisol levels being, you know, completely out of whack is, is one thing. You can't lose weight if you're, you're stressed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, you lose it to a certain point and then you're stool. Um, but also the... Um, the fact of the matter is that um, insulin levels can be influenced as well. So if people are eating at the wrong times of day, that could have an impact on their stools and um, on their weight loss. Because, you know, circadian cues from the environment aren't just from light. They're from exercise. They're from when you eat as well. And yeah. it just so happens if you've got a correct circadian rhythm and it's functioning correctly, which many people don't and, and probably many people listen to this don't, um, you know, it's all hormones are going to be all out of whack. Neuropeptides are going to be all out of whack. And yeah, you can cut your calories or, or change your macronutrients and lose some weight. Brilliant. But in terms of like getting to where you want to be sort of aesthetically, you've got to look at the number one, correcting your circadian rhythm through light. But also then once it's corrected, looking at how each of the 
peripheral oscillators, so the um, clock systems that are found in, say, the liver, pancreas, stomach, etc., all function. And if you start to have your meal timing and your exercise in line with um, circadian biology, you'll notice bigger gains in the gym if you're working out between 12 and 4. You'll notice better PBs on your cardiovascular exercise if you're working out in the morning. You'll notice better weight um, loss or even weight gain, depending on, on how you want to do it. If you're eating most of your calories in the morning, you know, about four hours after awakening when cortisol levels are starting to drop. And, um, you know, it's really interesting when you actually look at it that, you know, there's, there's other things that can impact insulin as well, not just blue light. So, mm. you know, there's, there's other studies out there that show that Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and even microwaves um, can impact blood glucose levels. So mm. there was this one study, it was, albeit it was only in a couple of people so i will caveat that yeah. they did these tests where they stood people next to a microwave just just your normal microwave oven you know put put your ready meal whatever crap you're putting in there to, to blitz um i don't have a microwave that's why i'm speaking so ill of it um, <laughs> you, you you put it on and you just stand there you know a couple of feet away watching it spin round as you do um and they tested blood glucose levels um, while that was happening and they saw them just increase and increase mm. until it got to whatever the, the high high level was that they were increasing. I can't quite remember. They switched that microwave off. OK. And then they started to walk away from the um, microwave that had been on and they were measuring every every minute. They were measuring blood glucose levels and 30 minutes afterwards it took to return back to base load. And wow. they hadn't eaten any food or anything like that. It was just the microwaves. So EMFs, um, you know, a real bad That's and, um, you know, Blue light from from artificial sources is another non-native EMF. It's an electromagnetic frequency like Wi-Fi and like um, microwaves and Bluetooth that is impacting our, our physiological system. So, you know, it's it's making us sick on so many different levels, blue lights. Um, you know, and I, I always say as well, I, I don't like to demonize it um, because blue light is present in the sun. Yeah. But what, what is also in the sun is the same level of red and the same level of orange light. And, mm -hmm. you know, what damage blue light does during the day, which is cellular um, damage, oxidation, things like that, is then repaired by red light. We, we've all heard of red light therapy devices. Yeah, exactly. And the sun is, yeah, and the sun's ultimately a red light therapy device. Um, yes, it gives out the blue light, gives us dopamine, gives us serotonin, gives us cortisol during the day, which is all essential. But on the flip side, because it's so full of energy, it damages cells in the eyes, macular degeneration, um, mm. digital eye strain. It damages cells in your skin, accelerated aging. But when you're outside in the sun, the red light then swoops in, repairs all that. So you don't see any of the, the issues um, from it. Whereas when you're actually sat looking at your smartphone, sitting under artificial light, you're getting all that blue shit light that's coming in. And then none of the red light to restore it so you see yeah. people like aging and withering and sitting under this blue light and getting these really sore eyes and then having to wear like prescription glasses and um it's because they're getting all the benefits of blue light during the day mm. but they're getting none of the um but they're also getting all of the um nasty side effects and then not exposing themselves to the red lights and the infrared lights that the sun gives out that actually repairs all that so that's why in a nutshell we're you know getting sicker and sicker as a population because of this artificial um, blue isolation light. Yeah, it's super interesting. Now, I did want to ask around, um, obviously you're talking about different circadian rhythms and people training and people eating. Um, yeah. Does it matter depending on the chronotype of the individual? So obviously there's, there's a few different types of, of people like the night owls compared to your, your morning larks or whatever that people would say. Um, is there a difference between the two as to when they should be eating, drinking, or is it typically like that after four hours you should try to get the, uh, sorry, after four hours of wake time you should try to get the heavy amount of calories in? Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you know what? I, um, I'm probably going to be a bit controversial here. I don't believe in chronotypes. Mm -hmm. I think that it's probably an intergenerational thing or a lifestyle thing that has created that rhythm in that person. I don't believe it's their natural rhythm. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, as a population, um, and, and this may be different between populations, you know, like Africans compared to us or Asians or, or whatever, it might be different Northern Europeans, et cetera, that have winters where there's literally zero sunlight. It's, it's going to be different. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you track it on your, um, you know, I've recently done sort of DNA testing and stuff to look at my ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, I have blue eyes. Um, so I'm very much, you know, Scandinavian, Northern European and, and yeah. how I interact circadianly speaking from the sun is, is going to be very different to other people um you know i squint more and you know my eyes have less melanin in which means you i've got to be careful with uv at specific times of the day mm -hmm. um but i think that with 
with you know the night owls and, and the larks and things like that I, I think that the first thing is before you coin um you know one coins an expression and saying oh i'm a night owl i'm a lark um or, or whatever it may be um they need to actually look at their circadian rhythm and, and just check that they're doing everything right to have a properly functioning circadian rhythm because i was always someone that stayed up late i used to watch the the, the premier league back in the uk when yeah. i was in australia at like two in the morning easily stay awake not a problem few beers stay up not a not an issue for me mm-hmm. and then i'd get up 11 12 o'clock the next day and i was like you know every night 11 12 o'clock in bed i'm definitely a night owl but then i, I switched that i changed my um, attitude towards light yeah um, i looked at everything from a circadian theoretical standpoint mm-hmm. and now i'm up at like 5 30 every morning like jumping out of bed um and i'm in bed by nine o'clock every night so you know to say that perhaps i had a specific chronotype i don't from from an n equals one perspective don't believe it's it's that much truth in it because mm. I could change mine very quickly and I didn't know how unhealthy I really was until I changed that and became a morning person. Um, so I think that people need to look at their circadian rhythms first before they turn around and say, you know, I love training at 1 a.m. or whatever it may be. I actually always did think that. And typically, like, it's hard to say because you look at a family and usually the whole family is of the same. So the parents yeah. wake up early, so the rest of the kids wake up early and everything else happens that way. Uh, whereas you get some families who sleep late and everyone in the house sleeps late. You're like, is that genetically based or is it the fact that that's just the lifestyle that they've been leading? So therefore, that's just how mm. everyone in the house is. So I always did kind of wonder that, especially because you would see it, I guess, as people get older and they change their lifestyle, they change their work. And whether they're a night person or not, they, they had to become a morning person because of work. Yeah. And they were fine yeah, and with a, that. That's a spot on point. It's like there's two very different things here. Are mm. you getting up at... 6 a.m. because you want to get up or are you getting up at 6 a.m. because your body clock is telling you to get up are two very very different things mm. um you know because you, you might have someone that loves staying up late it's like well I've, i get up early as well because i've got to get to work like mm. that's you know that's a choice that's not a circadian a, a good functioning circadian rhythm if they're like you know falling out of bed in the morning and, and downing six espressos just to like pet themselves <laughs> up you know so you know y- y- the feeling you get in the morning when your circadian rhythm is correct is you are literally boom, straight out of bed and outside. You, you you literally, from my point of view and from Katie's point of view now, is that if we don't get out of bed straight away within five, 10 minutes and get outside, we feel sick for the rest of the day um, mm. because our clocks are just all phase shifted and, and messed up. So yeah, two very different things, the, the need and the want to get up at, um, you know, in, in the mornings. Yeah, that's great. That's um, very insightful. And I mean, something that a lot of the, what we've already been talking about kind of leads on to is um, the studies around melanomas that came out. Um, mm. what, that was probably later last year you got the doctor to come in and do the, the guest blog on your, on your site, I believe. Yep. Yes. Um, but some crazy things like 35% of melanomas do not have anything to do with the sun. Uh, more sun exposure equals less chance of getting melanoma. So the more people are out in the sun, the more, um, the more sorry, the less chance they're actually going to get it, which means... People with lower vitamin D are more likely to get melanomas, and people with less melatonin then as well mm-hmm. are also likely to get mes- sorry are more likely to get melanomas. And I think that's kind of a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about relates back to that. But can we just kind of dive into this a little bit? Because I think people yep. will say like hear that and say oh whatever, but realistically <laughs> like there's a lot of a lot of come sorry a lot of stuff coming out about this now. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you a question. If I came and came around to your house right now and I, I got angry and I went behind you and I punched a hole in your wall, okay, um, and caused a lot of damage and you got angry at me and said, right, I want you to repair that, okay? And I said, yeah, you know what, I'm a bit out of order. I shouldn't have punched a hole in your wall. I go get some spackle and start to repair that wall, okay? But the finish that I've done is, is not that great. It's a little bit lumpy. You can see that I've punched a hole in the wall, but there's no hole there now. It's just sort of, you know, speckly and horrible. So what has caused the issue here is it me punching a hole in the wall or my shit spackling technique you know it's me punching the hole in the wall that is ultimately what's what's caused this issue and i guess the analogy is that uv light is essential but it will it will cause damage it will cause damage like blue light it will cause damage to your cells in large doses yeah now the repair mechanism for um for damage in in that respect is um is red light okay and it's also periods of darkness so when you actually look at the um, 
one recent study that came out, I think it was about three months ago now, mm-hmm. there was a discovery that, um, you know, we, we knew from a couple of years ago that the skin had its own um, melanopsin receptors in it that were yes. sensitive to blue light. But a, a more recent study has actually shown that the skin has its own circadian system in place for protection against environmental stimuli. OK, mm-hmm. um, and what that means is it's got two phases. It's got one during the day and it's basically activated by um, natural sunlight or, I guess, artificial light in in many people's cases. And what this does is it it allows for the synthesis of UV light um, to mix with cholesterol to produce something called vitamin D, which is essential for um, for health and wellness. Yeah. Um, And it it allows for, you know, blue light to do its thing, messages to be passed to clocks and, and things like that. It's, it's independent, this, this clock system that was discovered, um, completely from the master clock. So it, it acts on its own. Mm-hmm. Now, the second phase of the clock system that they discovered is darkness. Now, during darkness, and, and what we can coin here is physiological darkness. So that's the absence of blue and green light after sunset. Yeah. Is that it goes into something um, called a, like autophagy and apoptosis phase, where it works to clear out any of the damage that's happened during the day whilst UV light's been synthesized, whilst blue light's been, um, you know, sending messages and, and reacting with the skin in whatever way it needs to do. Yeah. Um, and it's what we're taking doing, out the trash cans. Basically, yeah, clearing yeah. it out. So what you find is the damage that you're caused during the day, um, if you've got a good functioning scaling rhythm, if your light hygiene is correct in your house and you've got no blue light that is going to shine on your skin, your skin will go into repair mode and it will clear any of that damage and you won't have any melanomas, you know, or, or you'll significantly reduce your um, uh, your likelihood of getting melanoma. Mm-hmm. And we've got to be careful here in Australia because of the thinning of or the, the historical thinning of the ozone layer. So yeah. the damage that's caused by UV is probably going to be quicker in us here in Australia. But ultimately, what we're doing is we're going out and maybe sun baking, maybe going for a walk. Um, maybe we put sun cream on or not, whatever takes people's fancy, do what you want. Um, we're getting the damage of, of UV light, but then we're not putting our skin into repair mode. Yeah. We're going in, we're switching the telly on. It still thinks it's daytime. There's no repair happening of any of that damage. And then over time, we're wondering why we're getting melanoma. Yes, it's probably because of the damage of the UV, but we're not allowing ourselves to repair that because that damage can be repaired naturally by the correct light environment. So we've just got to be very careful what we're blaming because it's like blaming cholesterol for heart attacks when it's actually inflammation yeah. that is causing um, those those heart attacks. And, um, you know, you've, it's the correlation causation thing. It's like mm. saying that fire engines cause fires because they're always at the scene of a fire. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like UV light being like, oh yeah, UV light's causing the damage because when we shine UV light onto skin cells in the lab, it shows that they mutate and become cancerous. And it's like, yeah, that's, that is the case. But if you then take that light away from those cells and put it in complete darkness, you will see those cells that's start recover. to recover. Mm. Um, so this is why we've got, um, you know, really, high levels of of melanoma across the the developed world um, because we're just living under artificial suns basically 24 7 we're devoid of darkness um so we can't go into any repair stage so you know i think you know i'm not i'm not not saying to people go outside at between 12 and 3 and when it's 40 degrees in in queensland and sunbake that would be stupid yeah we've got to always look back at look at look at what animals do and look what our ancestors might have done they probably would have been out in the morning uv light is pretty much non-existent in the mornings and then it slowly increases throughout the day and then drops off again um our ancestors would have hunted during cool periods of the day Mm -hmm. when you look at animals now when it's searing hot they're sat in the shade they're not in direct sunlight they're still getting the benefits of the light um and and the thing is as well morning sun is is very interesting in protecting against melanoma because we have a natural sunscreen that we produce in our body called Mm -hmm. melanin Mm-hmm. And melanin is typically produced when you people call it like a base tan, you know, you sort of build up a tan, you get darker. So people that are in Africa have got, you know, loads and loads of melanin. Yeah. And people um, like my missus, who's from Wales, has literally none. Yeah. So she only needs to be outside for a very small period of time to get her dose of UV, uh-huh. whereas um, an African would need to be outside for a long, long period of time to get their dose of vitamin D because mm-hmm. of UV through vitamin D because they 
have grown up in equatorial areas. The sun is overhead and a very high UV throughout the day. Whereas someone like Katie, who's grown up in Wales, where the sun comes out maybe for half an hour a week, um, you know, doesn't need that much of a burst. But you can also change the amount of melanin in your skin by going outside and watching that sunrise in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why Katie and I now are literally so brown. And we need, we can then stand being outside in high UV times for longer than someone that doesn't do what we do because Mm. you know your average joe is going to basically not go out and watch the sunrise in the morning slather themselves with sun cream and then get out in high uv at midday till about five o'clock at night not see the sun um set to get the restorative red lights and then complain about melanoma 20 years down the line Mm. or you know chronic sunburn whereas if they actually got to the beach um Mm. you know at 7 a.m stayed there for two or three hours when you you know didn't need sun cream on sunglasses don't need to be on um and then they took themselves off home um or down down the pub whatever it is indoors out the way of um you know the sun in those high uv periods over time they would then be able to stay out longer and longer until they could stay out for the whole day and another really interesting study and stop me if i'm ranting on here was sunglasses like it's been doing the rounds for years and it pops up every now and again that when you wear sunglasses outside, people are like, oh, yeah, but you're going to get UV damage, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at it from a circadian uh, standpoint, what do sunglasses do? They filter out light. Dark. Yeah. Yeah. And they make it dark. So you're putting these sunglasses on. Your central clock system is basically saying, OK, right, it's, it's, it's nighttime or it's you know later on during the day. There's no UV present. So we can send a message to the skin clock. Um, you know, you don't need to protect against UV because it's dark. It's getting dark now. UV light's going to be minimal. Yet the sun is beating down UV onto the skin and it's mm-hmm. not in the correct circadian phase to handle that UV light, which can then lead to melanoma as well. So, you know, there's so much context to be applied. And, you know, basically, if you can just be sensible with the sun, mm. be cognizant to the fact that your light hygiene has to be as ancestral as possible. Um, you're not going to suffer from these things. And, you know, Katie and I have only got to look at the sun now to go like a lovely golden brown. And, and we, we literally don't burn. We spent 10 days in the Maldives, no sunscreen, no sunglasses um, and didn't burn. Just yeah. gold brown the whole time. We were out from 5 a.m. when the sun rose till literally 5 p.m. when the sun set. We were out for that whole amount of time popped in for lunch around about midday but we still ate outside um and and had no issues with um with vision with sunburn anything it was literally spot on no sun cream whatsoever so Mm. you you can build up to this stage and um and it's yeah well worth doing because you're you're protected and you're not going to you know going to minimize that risk of um sun damage and melanoma and you know none of us are you know mid 30s been doing this for years none of us are wrinkly or anything you know no, exactly. we around sun constantly yeah stay sun the same we don't don't wear sunglasses we will we'll barely wear sun cream uh it, like every once in a while if we're having a big sunday sorry a big day at the beach then we definitely will but yes we make sure that we get ones that are not full of certain toxins and stuff as well we really really are quite cautious with that but i mean it's it's really interesting hearing you talk about that and it seems quite intuitive to the body because you think about what happens after being out in the sun for a big day like if you go to the beach for the day and you've been outside for a while or you see people who get um, <clears throat> who are out in the sun, they are always really tired. Like the body mm. is always saying, hey, I need sleep now. I need recovery. And it just makes so much sense when you talk about the two different clocks um, because it's like your body just naturally says, hey, I need that time to be able to, to be in the dark now, to be able to be asleep. Um, but whether we listen to it or not is the other, is the other factor. So yeah. <laughs> it'd be really interesting to see if people got burnt uh, and they slept longer if they would then recover faster. And I guess that's a hard thing to be able to, to actually study, but it, it pretty much sounds like that if you do get sunburnt, you should try to sleep a lot more um, as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, I think so. I think it makes complete sense. Um, but just making sure you're sleeping in complete darkness as well, you know, because yeah. it's, it's all very well sleeping. But if your phone's going off or your partner's going up to use the bathroom or, you know, the neighbor's got a security light on outside and a cat walks past, you know, all this is going to really tell your body, you. oh, it's yeah, it's it's not going to repair. So you just got to, um, you know, sleep is, is, is great. I think it's, it's, it's the repair mechanism in the body. It's mm-hmm. for filing memories. It's for cleaning out, you know, adenosine, by, nasty byproducts and um, autophagy and apoptosis. And I think we've, we've also got to remember as well that sleep is, is, is a seasonal thing. And, 
you know, you're going to naturally get less sleep in the summer um, just because of the the position of the earth. And, you know, winter, you're going to need and and get more sleep um, because of the spin of the earth. And, you know, a lot of people always come to us and and say, well, I need to get eight hours every day and and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, well, no, it's it's not going to be like that. Don't worry if you get six hours of sleep in the summer. If you get 10 hours of sleep in the in the winter, it all, you know, is is from a circadian standpoint, you know, exactly what we need to do. So, you know, it might be that winter periods after after the summer has happened, you get this sort of phase into autumn and winter where you get darker nights. Maybe that's to allow us to recover and sleep longer from the damage that's been caused during the hotter summer months. So maybe mm. it is more on a macro rather than a micro level of sort of getting a good night's sleep after sunburn. Maybe it's more a case of seasonal sleeping that could be, you know, winter is that repair um you know that 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 repair period and it makes yeah. sense from a dietary standpoint as well because mm-hmm. you know I, I i eat a lot of plants so I, I i like eating vegetables but a lot of people don't um you know and i think that they're great um but they also have things like oxalates and um yeah. you know anti-nutrients in but when we look at winter what would we have eaten ancestrally we probably would have just eaten meat and fish because vegetables exactly. wouldn't have grown. yeah so maybe winter is a time for healing um mm. and that's why you know animals hibernate we get more sleep we're more sedentary and, and it's that recovery period and we eat meat that isn't inflammatory um and then we wait for the summer and we do get all the benefits from the fresh fruit and and vegetables but any of the you know flip side damage that's being caused we wait till winter and, and it gets cleared out so yeah, that's quite fascinating. I, I like that concept. That's that's quite cool. And it was pretty interesting. We actually went over to Europe, not last year, the year before, during um, during the, our winter, their summer, and we were in places like um, like Sweden, and they had four hours of of, of nighttime, and yeah. we were awake for a lot of the day, and getting four hours a night of sleep, and still felt just absolutely incredible. Like we didn't have the stress because we we're on a holiday. Um, mm-hmm. and we were eating well we made sure that we were getting outside heaps we were going out and we were adventuring around a lot and we just we felt almost like the freshest we've ever felt and it's crazy yeah. you're, you're sleeping four hours a night but it makes a lot of sense <laughs> that the sun's up and it's energizing you it's saying hey it's time to be awake um, and you're only sleeping those, those minimal amounts of time yeah and you know what um, those regions have in common is it's cold Yes. And what does the cold do? It reduces inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, so any of the, um, you know, lack of sleep perhaps you're getting in those regions is um, then offset from the anti-inflammatory effects of, of cold. So mm-hmm. and the amount of seafood that's in the diets in those regions is very high, which contains very high levels of vitamin D and DHA, you know, things that, um, you know, sunlight are involved in in those sort of more equatorial regions. So, you know, nature always puts things in place. And that's why we always say that you know, do your ancestry, like, you know, yeah. look where you're from, like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not, um, uh, like the, the uh, you know, an Aboriginal sort of, um, heritage, you know, you can tell that I have blue yeah. eyes and, and I'm Caucasian and, you know, looking back and, you know, 80% of my DNA is Scandinavian and French. And mm. I can then look at that latitude and how I should live my life based on that latitude. And, um, or I can look at it another way in, in so much as I want to live here in, in Perth and what are the fundamentals I need to do in order to um, live a, a healthy and prosperous life here. And when it comes to light, it's trying to get myself the same color as, as the native people of this um, population. And that's by going out in the morning and getting high doses of sun mm. to build up my mel- melanin levels and get darker because they have evolved here to, to de- develop yeah. more melanin, have a darker skin to protect themselves from the damages, damaging effects of UV. So you've got to kind of look at both scenarios. And, um, you know, if, if you just, you know, Joe blogs from Ireland coming over on a working holiday and, you know, you're sticking yourself in Brisbane heat in the, in the middle of uh, January, you, you're going to do yourself a, a lot of damage. Whereas, um, you know, if your Joe blogs coming from Ireland and you want to live here and for, for the rest of your life, then let's look at some lifestyle shifts when it comes to light, blocking the blue light after dark, um, putting the red light bulbs in the house and getting a, a you know, a, a hell of a lot of sun in the mornings to build up that melanin level and, and put yourself on a, a level playing field with um, the other members of the population that, um, that are doing well and thriving um, without getting skin cancers. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, something that I actually read from, from you, which was before our daughter was born, was around the uh, the mother's milk and circadian rhythm, how that can really affect the baby. And it was only recently where we had run out of milk that Stace had 
um, had got ready for Mads in the like we ran out of nighttime milk. I mean, we only had morning milk, and Stace had to yeah. go out and do some some work. Just running a women's circle, and it meant that I was at home with Mads, and I only had this nighttime. I saw this morning milk, and it was nighttime. And it was like I'm, I'm putting it to bed. And it was crazy to actually see it. I, I don't know if it's just because I was more aware of it because I'd read the study or, or what, but pretty much I watched her. She was so tired, yet she was just awake. Like she just, her eyes were red. She was crying. She's like, I just want to be asleep. Like that's, that's literally the face she was giving yeah. me. But she was just alert and she was awake. And eventually we got to go to sleep, but it really made me think I, like how much the milk can really affect her. And it's something mm. that you guys have done a lot on is actually the breast milk and the chrono nutrition mm-hmm. for the baby. And, and um, that was kind of the first time I witnessed it. But something that I was talking to you about before we started recording was Stace is in a lot of mother's groups and talks to a lot of different mums. And of, of all of them, she's the only one that does anything about blue light. She's she's probably the major one that does anything about her nutrition like in, on a big level, like doesn't drink caffeine, makes sure she's eating healthful foods. Um, really looks after what she's doing, and these other mums talk about going and having lots of caffeine. Like, oh, I need I need three or four coffees to get me through the day, and then yeah. they talk about having wines to bring them back down over night time because they're so amped up because of the caffeine they had all day. And it, in my head, it's like no wonder your child is is amped up and then is screaming over night time and not sleeping well. Um, but yet, some people will say, well, studies say you could have one to two coffees a day without it being an issue. Um, what, what are kind of the studies that you guys are seeing around the chrono nutrition for the babies? Yeah, absolutely. Well, a, a baby isn't born with the circadian rhythm. Um, it has to develop one mm-hmm. um, and it has to do so through um, both the, the correct environment that it's living in um, from a light perspective, but also through something called chrono nutrition, um, which is what um, you were alluding to there. So in terms of um, the light environment, I'll do this one first, is that um you just need to ensure that your baby is getting the correct circadian signals at the correct time of the day. So if you're, you know, not allowing your baby to be up at the sunrise, um, there's no UV present at that time of the day. So there's no excuse not to have the baby out um, in the in the sun in that first you know, maybe 10 minutes of the day, just a small dose, Mm -hmm. um, that will send light signals again, like it does to the, to us that, you know, to entrain that circadian clock and and start making patterns. Um, but the main, main issues come later on in the day when you're doing night feeds or or feeds after sunset and you're feeding the baby underneath blue light. Um, Mm. you know, that's giving messages that, you know, it's it's still daytime and and you're getting this scrambled circadian system in in the babies. Um, so it's going to take, one, you know, in the best case scenario, longer for the baby to develop a, a correct circadian rhythm or two, it may not ever develop a proper circadian rhythm. Oh, wow. and if you don't, yeah. And if you don't develop a proper circadian rhythm, then you're going to lead to things like, you know, we're seeing today, which is a lot of circadian mis- mismatch diseases in young children. Um, you know, people are getting a bit more like kids are getting more anxious and, and depressed. And, um, you know, they're, they're putting on weight a lot quicker than, um, you know, eating the same amount that perhaps a brother or a sister has eaten that's got a mm-hmm. correctly functioning clock. But there's such easy hacks around it. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like make the baby's feeding room if it's after dark with red lights, just have a nightlight mm-hmm. or some red light bulbs in there and you know then you're protecting your um circadian rhythm and the, the baby's one from developing mm. but the biggest um biggest study that came out was the chrono nutrition study and um that was probably about three four months ago now as well some really cool studies all in the same time came out and it looked at um hormonal and neurotransmitter composition of breast milk pumped at specific times of the day mm-hmm. so they divided breast milk into two sections ones that were pumped during the day and breast milk that was pumped after sunset. Now, the breast milk that was pumped during the day contained one hormone, and that was cortisol. And cortisol makes us, is is great for during the day because it makes us feel awake and it keeps us awake. Um, Now, on the flip side, the breast milk that was pumped after sunset had no cortisol levels in it, but high levels of something called tryptophan and um, melatonin. Now, those two hormones neurotransmitters are actually um pivotal in creating and inducing sleep and deep restorative sleep yeah so 
for instance, tryptophan is um, one of the reactants with serotonin, which is produced in the gut during the day from being in sunlight to produce more melatonin. So the mother's breast milk is giving the baby, yeah, a dose of melatonin to help that circadian clock system become entrained after dark. But also it's got high levels of tryptophan. So if the baby's been outside during the day getting good levels of serotonin in the gut, those two mix to create more melatonin, which is going to lead to a healthier baby and also mm. um, a better circadian rhythm. Mm. But what happens if you do what people do these days, which is um, share the, the load? split you know and switch the milks around yeah once you gave your baby the milk that was pumped during the day after sunset well you're going to tell the brain and the clock system that it's daytime because you're pumping the baby full of cortisol mm. which is going to keep them awake even though they don't want to be awake it's like waking up at 2 a.m in the morning knowing you want to go back to sleep and you're taking a double shot of espresso <laughs> um you're not you're, you're going to want to go back to sleep but you physically can't close your eyes um, and yeah. So you just got to label the breast milk, um, yes. and it's, it's, it can be difficult for women because I think that they're um, more likely to lactate in the daytime. Um, which, again, you know, from an ancestral point of view, maybe the baby, if it's you know fed correct um, milk, only needed feeding up until it, you know, I don't know, just some random number nine o'clock at night when it got the final dose of melatonin and tryptophan, and then be out like a light through the um, uh, through the night. Because you mm. always see. Um, some parents say, oh, you know, my baby's not sleeping. And then all of a sudden for a week they sleep and then they go back and regress. And I, I always wonder, well, what did you do? What did you do differently? Did you actually change the milk? Um, did you actually feed correctly? Did you not have as many night feeds with lights on things? So no, it's a really easy fix. Just label your breast milk yeah. um, and <clears throat> excuse me. And also um, just ensure that, you know, where, when you're feeding a baby at night, you've got blue blockers on yourself and there's red light. So you're not sending a message to the the baby's developing circadian rhythm saying it's daytime. Yeah, I mean, that's all things we've been doing, which is great. It's awesome to hear that. Like, and, and I, I knew that we've been doing things like we've been on purpose. We've been doing things like that. But to actually know that the studies and science behind it say, hey, this is really evident as to what you're doing for your baby yeah. is really beneficial. And we've got the best sleeper of all the babies that we know. Um, and uh, I think it's purely because of the things that we're doing. But also, so many people talk to us about the four-month progression. Like, we had we had Mads who were sleeping through the night from six weeks onwards and people would say, oh, just you wait. And it's, I don't know, it's almost like a, we had to go through it, so you're going to too. Um, yeah. And it was always a just you wait to the four month and she's past four months now and she didn't have the regression. We, we've kept doing the things that we're doing, like pretty much from, from her bedtime, sorry, from her bath time onwards, we make sure that we're in red lights that Stace is always running her blue blocks whenever she's feeding. And um, yeah, if she ever does express milk, she expresses it and we're always about the time on it and freeze it up, ready for when, yeah. for when we need it. So um, it was just that one time and I was so so mindful of it because I'd read the study, but we'd just run out of nighttime milk that, that Stacey throws and I was like, oh no, what have we done here? <laughs> oh, no. um, yeah, it was quite oh, funny no. to watch it all, all unfold. Yeah, how about yeah. Um, the disruption of circadian? It's like this will probably be the last one we go through, uh, okay. based on time. But yeah, disruption. Sorry, disrupted circadian rhythm impacting the fertility and reproductive system or reproductive health uh, for men and women. What's what's the studies coming out of this one here? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you sort of um, uh, a snapshot of it because I've done whole episodes on on these recently. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, you, you've got to look at it. Um, from uh, like a peripheral oscillator standpoint, there's mm -hmm. a lot of clock systems within the body that run um, by themselves, but are influenced by the master clock as well. So if you've got a disrupted master clock, um, which all of us pretty much will do, um, probably except for us um, that are speaking now to actually do the right things, is that um, it will impact the melatonin production at various junctions. And melatonin, as I said, is a very powerful antioxidant. Mm -hmm. And it's actually produced not just in the pineal gland, but in areas of the body that suffer from high oxidative stress. Okay. And two areas in women that has very high oxidative stress is the placenta, because obviously that's where all the, it's almost like the filter of nutrients through to the baby, yeah. but also the ovaries as well. Um, so when you're not producing optimal levels of melatonin, so you're sitting in artificial blue and green light after dark, you might be wearing your blue blockers, but your skin's exposed. You're going to produce less melatonin at those sites, which can actually lead to reproductive health, health issues. But it can also um, intensify and increase your odds of things like polycystic ovary um, wow. syndrome as, as well. Yeah. Um, so that's the literature is very clear on that. Um, estrogen 
and prolactin are also influenced by disrupted body clocks. Yeah. Um, it can make estrogen levels go low or high. Um, prolactin is, is another one. Um, and if prolactin actually becomes um, disrupted from a circadian standpoint, that can actually also intensify um, PCOS as well. Hmm. Um, so people need to be cognizant to that. Where there's a really interesting study um, about night shift workers, um, nurses, um, that came out a while ago that shows that those women that work night shift, um, 100% of the time in this study, um, they had a irregular um, and longer menstrual cycle, um, which wow. obviously isn't great. Um, yeah. And that was due to a circadian disruption. Now, takes two to tango so men haven't got it um haven't got it easy as well if you've got a disrupted circadian rhythm you're going to impact quite a few things testosterone being one mm -hmm. men who um go to bed later um and get up later typically have lower levels of testosterone mm -hmm. testosterone levels from a circadian standpoint should be higher in the morning and higher in spring in men um so that if you're looking to conceive that's the time you want to do it if you're having trouble yeah there's also um, another study that showed that men who went to bed after midnight compared to men who went to bed before midnight had 50% lower conception rates. Um, the, the guys that went to bed later had 50% lower conception rates with their partner than those who went to bed um, before midnight. And they also, also measured the sperm count and quality and found that sperm um, count and quality was much higher in those that went to bed earlier. So you might be a night owl, but your sperm might not thank you. Um, <laughs> and the final one in males as well is that we produce something called anti-sperm antibody. Okay. okay. So ASA, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It destroys sperm. And it just goes through and kills off all the you know the duds that are in there and um, keeps you keeps you healthy. Mm. People that have a disrupted um, circadian rhythm and go to bed later, have 48% um, in this one study um, increase in this ASA. Um, yeah, so basically what was happening is that, you know, it could have been twofold. It could have been that going to bed late is creating more dodgy sperm and you need more of this ASA to clear them out, mm. or it's just producing more a ASA because that clock system is disrupted and it's just going through and destroying good sperm as well as bad sperm and what they found was in that same study they, they tested for sperm count and quality and found that um yeah and that decreased as well in line with asa increasing so that's probably the um the the, the high level overview of it but yeah, yeah. i spent an hour on a couple of podcasts just on that subject um, which is interesting that is super interesting so let, let's uh give i guess the shift workers a little bit of light then as to what they can do because if they're essentially in, in under um fake light all night every night um, they should then essentially be trying to make their their room as dark as possible for the night or for their night time when they're trying to sleep right so then they're actually getting good quality sleep that's somewhat restful yeah it's a difficult one because ultimately the advice you can give to night shift workers will improve their plight mm -hmm. but you're not going to eradicate it you're going to still be massively all-cause mortality rates um through yeah. the roof by yeah. working night shift so number one don't work night shift not possible for a lot of people too um, you can put some hacks in place so make sure your skin is covered um, as much as possible when you're under that artificial light during your night shift because there's no natural light coming in yeah. wear blue light filtering glasses so mm -hmm. the yellow lenses typically is what a lot of nurses and doctors wear um, the ones that summer glow that, that blue blocks create are the, the, the go-to ones for doctors and nurses yeah but it's after the shift that's the most important thing you need you need to be getting sunlight um, mm -hmm. And you need to be outside um, as soon as you finished your shift, getting that sunlight because you can't devoid yourself of sunlight. You need no, it. You need it. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah, exactly. So they need to do that. They need to ground to the earth. Um, mm -hmm. Shoes and socks need to come off bare feet on the grass or the sand. That will reduce the inflammation caused by a lot of that artificial light you've been working under and the stress of working outside of a, a, a natural circadian rhythm. And also um, cold shower if people can stomach it is, is excellent as well or a cold dip in the ocean is even better because of yeah. the salt that's salt in there well. mm. and um then pop in your, your red blue, lock, blue red blue blockers on the sleep plus from blue blocks is, is the best um and then like you said sleeping in a completely dark room mm -hmm. um and then trying to get a good amount of sleep but when you wake up 
get outside straight Again, away and yeah. literally live outside. You need to get natural light, otherwise that's what's gonna gonna screw you. More so than working under the artificial light. A lot of people just don't get any of the natural light. So that's needed as well. And you can look at things as well and, and I've, I've had some good experiences with molecular hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to get. I typically take it when I'm traveling um, across time zones or whether I feel like I've got a, a bout of coronavirus coming on or something. I'll, I'll pop a couple of those and it will flush it out. So maybe um, look at molecular hydrogen as well when you're working night shifts. So um, that's probably some good sort of quick hacks there, I think. <laughs> That's unreal. Well, uh, mate, thank you so much for joining me. This has been super insightful. I really enjoyed this episode. Um, before we before we leave, I guess um, people can find you at blueblocks.com, but which is B L U B L O X. Um, you guys are about to launch a podcast as well. That's so yesterday uh, podcast, yes. which is coming soon. When is the release date for that? First of April is what we're aiming for. Um, yeah, we've recorded so many cool. Um, podcast. We've got some Real Housewives of Melbourne, if people awesome. like that kind of uh, um, program coming on. We've got um, a date set for Melissa Ambrosini to come on and talk about her journey. So we're, um, yeah, we've got so many cool people that we've interviewed or are interviewing. And we are literally taking it a little bit different because I've been on so many some podcasts podcast. now. And, yeah. yeah. And we, we say the same thing to each podcast, which is cool. I don't mind doing it. But if you're following all those podcasts, listening to me say the same thing all the time, it can be a bit, oh, here we go again. Mm -hmm. So we want to actually take people that have educated people on various aspects of health, wellness and, you know, career, business. And we want to dive, dive straight into, I think, their personal journeys um, yeah. and what makes them tick and, and some of the advice they've got um, that, that led them along the way. And we've had some we had a really cool one yesterday from this guy that's like the, one of the top guys in like health and wellness when it comes to like um, autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. And we spent about 40 minutes talking about how he took 900 magic mushrooms in a day when he was younger and like all the trips he was having. And it's just like, yeah, just diving into stuff that he goes on every show saying like, you know, oh, you know, this is what you need to do. do, do, do. And we managed to get out of him his um, drug addiction in his in his teen years. So, you know, it's, it's just just to find the like yeah like the, the real humanization of, of these people and um that's yeah. what we've been trying to do and it's worked well so it's definitely a cool one if, if people want to tune in first of april oh mate that's awesome i'm looking forward to it and uh whereabouts can they follow along with socials yeah so um if they want to follow me um it's i am andy mant on instagram um blue blocks um, a lot of education on there is just at blue blocks official the Light and Health Group, as always, is, has gotten really big now, about 6,000 mm -hmm. strong in there. Just Google Light and Health. It's the top one on, on Facebook. And then, um, you know, join our mailing list as well because um, I send out blogs on that, YouTube videos, um, all very basic stuff that's that's meant to empower and help people. So definitely jump on the website and sign up to the mailing list. That's that's probably the best thing to do as well. Yeah, very insightful. It's literally where we got all the show notes from for today. Like it, it, this, this stuff is stuff that you send out all the time. So if you want to stay in the loop with this, then definitely jump across to bluebox.com and sign up for their uh, mailing list. That'd be awesome. Well, Andy, thank you again, man. I really appreciate the time. It's, um, it's been a really cool podcast. Yeah, pleasure as always, Matty. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks, mate.